Monroe Doctrine Although these foreign agreements were of great importance to establishing American sovereignty, the cornerstone of Monroe's foreign policy came in 1823 and has been stamped with the president's name. The origin of the Monroe Doctrine is found in the turbulent years of the Napoleonic Wars. These wars touched South America, sparking widespread revolution. After peace was re-established in Europe in 1815, Spain began making noises about reclaiming its colonies. President Monroe responded in his 1823 message to Congress with the four principles now known as the Monroe Doctrine. 1. The Americas were no longer available for colonization by any power. 2. The political system of the Americas was essentially different from that of Europe. 3. The United States would consider any interference by European powers in the Americas a direct threat to you. S. Security. 4. The United States would not interfere with existing colonies or with the internal affairs of European nations. Nor would the U. S. Participate in European wars. Age of Jackson. The single strongest candidate in the presidential election of 1824 was Andrew Jackson Old Hickory. The hero of New Orleans. The candidate of the people. However, Jackson did not win the election. As the facade of the era of good feelings crumbled away. No party had replaced the Federalists to oppose the Democratic Republicans. Within the Democratic Republican camp, however, a host of candidates emerged, each reflecting deep regional divisions. The Tennessee and Pennsylvania state legislatures nominated Jackson. Kentucky nominated Henry Clay. Massachusetts nominated John Quincy Adams. And Congress presented William H. Crawford. In the subsequent election, Jackson received 99 electoral votes, Adams 84, Crawford 41, and Clay 37. Because none of the candidates had a majority, the election was sent to the House of Representatives to choose from among the top three. Illness forced Crawford out of the running and the choice was between Adams and Jackson. Because Adams had supported the American system, Henry Clay threw his support in Congress behind him. The House voted Adams into office over Jackson, who had received the greater number of electoral votes, charging that a corrupt bargain had been made. Jackson's supporters split from the Democratic Republican Party and became Democrats. Supporters who remained loyal to Clay were known as National Republicans. Adams bad a tough time as a minority president, but he nevertheless boldly submitted a nationally based program to a Congress and a public that had become increasingly splintered into regional and other special interests. Adams' support of canals and other internal improvements his call for the establishment of a national university, and his advocacy of scientific explorations, all for the common national good, were largely rejected by Congress. Instead, Congress focused on laissez-faire expansionism and frontier individualism. This attitude, which prevailed through the nation, swept Jackson into office in 1828. Jackson, seventh president of the United States, was the first who had not been born in patrician Virginia or New England. Although he was, in fact, a wealthy man who lived in a magnificent mansion, 
The Hermitage. Outside of Nashville. Tennessee. Jackson was also a self made son of the Carolina back country. By the political geography of the day, he was a Westerner. There can be no doubt that Andrew Jackson's two terms as president from 1829 to 1837 brought a greater degree of democracy to American government. Jackson's contemporaries, as well as subsequent generations of historians, have debated whether the kind of democracy his administration fostered was always a good thing. During the Jackson years, most states abandoned property ownership as a prerequisite for the right to vote. This move broadened the electorate and made elected officials act in a way that was more fully representative of the people who had put them in office. While this transformation nurtured democracy, it also encouraged demagoguery. Although Jackson introduced a policy of equitable rotation in federal jobs, the forerunner of the modern civil service system, he also brought with him the so-called spoils system, boldly rewarding his supporters with lucrative and secure government jobs known today as political patronage. Jackson also engineered the defeat of a program of internal improvements that was sponsored by Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams. Jackson argued that the plan favored the wealthy, yet, in defeating it, he retarded the development of commerce in the West, the very territory of his constituency. A believer in the paramount importance of preserving the Union, Jackson worked vigorously to silence the growing abolitionist movement, fearing that those who wanted to end slavery would tear the nation apart. Jackson reserved his strongest venom for the Second Bank of the United States. Never persuaded of the bank's constitutionality. Jackson was also acutely aware that his supporters hated the institution. When the bank's charter came up for renewal, Jackson opposed it, vetoing a wreck Carter bill. After winning re-election in 1832, he issued an executive order withdrawing all federal deposits from the bank. That was a fatal blow. And the bank fizzled, finally closing its doors when its charter expired in 1836. With the demise of the second, Bank of the United States. Credit became more plentiful, and westward settlement proceeded more rapidly.